VoiceOver Coffee Shop, Episode 10. Welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in VoiceOver. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there. My name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in VoiceOver. If you'd like to know more about me, feel free to visit my personal website at www.voicebard.com. In this episode, we have coffee with the amazingly talented Neil Ross. Neil is a British American voice actor and author of the book Vocal Recall, who has lent his voice to many notable projects, such as Voltron, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Darkwing Duck, and Spider Man, to name off a few. In this episode, We'll talk about how to develop multiple characters at once, working on video game scripts, and acting yourself versus escaping reality. Well, I have the coffee. Yeah. So, Neil, how do you take your coffee? I just a little dollop of milk or cream, anything uh, that, that's white, you can put it in there, and I'm good to go. So, um, you started in radio, correct? Yes. Yes. So how did you go from radio to animation? Well, I had always fiddled around with doing uh, accents and voices. Uh, it began when I was very young, uh, five, six years old. We didn't have a television in the house in those days, and so it was pretty much the radio and the little record player I had with a few uh, records that were spoken word type records. But mostly it was the radio, and I just uh, discovered that I had this strange compulsion to try to imitate a lot of what I heard, the different kinds of voices. The high ones, the raspy ones, you know, the, bear, the interesting accents that I would hear. This was happening in Canada, so we had a smattering of shows from the United States, Canadian shows, and a lot of stuff from the BBC in England. So I did hear a lot of different accents and voices, and I would try to reproduce them. And it wasn't with any thought of making any money out of it. It just uh, was fun to do. And uh, then I got into radio, as you mentioned, and uh, I was a disc jockey and production guy. And I didn't get to do a lot with the voice characters that I did up until or oh, the early 70s when I got involved in doing a radio comedy show in San Diego that was a satire of the local uh, <laughs> the local marijuana scene. In those days, it was very <laughs> innocent. All this horrible cartel stuff wasn't going on. It was just <laughs> some fairly enterprising dopers selling to other uh, dopers, you know, for 15 bucks a lid. And we just sort of made fun of the whole thing. And uh, working with another guy who came up with a concept, it was called The Adventures of the OB Ranger. OB stood for Ocean Beach, which was a community in San Diego where allegedly a lot of this activity took place. And he was sort of the lone ranger, only he was a narc and he was utterly inept. And I basically, the guy I worked with played the OB Ranger, and we had a wonderfully talented woman who played all the female parts, and I played everybody else. I probably played up, up, upwards of 20 different characters, Jesus. and that was the first time I'd ever really done anything like that, and it turned out, I thought, pretty well. There wasn't really anybody around I could go to and say, is this really any good, or am I kidding myself? I mean, wow. nobody knew down in San Diego. But that, that sort of got me thinking, because I would start to look at the Saturday morning cartoons, and I would say, I, I think I could do that. And then two seconds later, I'd think, who are you kidding? You know, they throw you out in two seconds. But, but that was when I began to think in terms of maybe getting involved in animation. At that point, I had no idea that the voiceover business even existed. It was a very well-kept secret in those days. It was a tiny little niche part of show business. Hardly anybody knew it was happening. And there was a relative handful of people doing it. But I finally did discover that it existed around, uh, well, in the early 70s. And once I did, I, I thought to myself, boy, if there was ever any kind of a job where I could use 100% of what I had to offer, 
it would be voiceovers. Radio, sadly, I was only using, I don't know, 40, 50% of what I was capable of. So that was my goal was to get into voiceovers. And it took another, oh, from the early, it took about 10 years, all told. But I finally managed to, to break in in the early 80s. So with you having to balance so many characters, what was the um, the character development process like when you were like, okay, here's the script in front of me. Here's um, here's kind of where I'm going to go in, in, in this direction yeah. or this direction, especially having such a wide range all in like one or two programmings. Yeah, well, I, I did what I've, what I've always done. Um, you, somebody creates a character and uh, you have perhaps a, a visual to go along with it and a, a sort of a description of the general uh, makeup of the character. And you, uh, some, somewhere in my head, if things go well, I begin to hear a voice that I think would fit that character. And then the trick is to uh, bring it out of the throat, make it actually happen. And it's just, just that simple, you know, it's, um, well, you know, an exercise, anyone who's interested in doing this stuff, uh, watch a cartoon show and imagine that if they call, uh, just focus on one particular character, it doesn't matter which one it is, but imagine if you were at an audition and they called you in and they said, we've decided to change the voice of this character. We don't like what this actor is doing. We want to make it completely different. What do you got? And what do you got? What would you do? You know, if they called you in, if they all went insane and called you in and said, we're going to change Bart <laughs> Simpson's voice, what would you come up with? You know, yeah. the trick is to get it out of Mr. Throat and into the microphone. Right. So with so many different characters, what character resonated with you the most? where you felt like you put part of yourself into that? Well, it's, uh, you know, I try to do, uh, do a hundred, give a hundred percent to anything that I get involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the characters that probably fit nicest and, and were the easiest to do are, are, are kind of the same ones the fans are still interested in. The Shipwreck and G.I. Joe. Uh, Springer and Transformers, uh, and a particular favorite of mine in a show that was never that popular, unfortunately, uh, that was called The Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. There was a character in there named Whitley White. He was the local news guy at the television and the radio station in the little town where this story took place. And uh, I patterned him after a Southern California broadcaster who was uh, somewhat in love with the sound of his own voice. And uh, he would go on at great lengths on the radio with his wonderful voice. And I sort of borrowed uh, some of his traits for Whitley. And the show was cleverly written that uh, they, they would give him these nice long monologues. And I would be this close to cracking up with laughter when I would do them because the combination of what they wrote and this voice that I was doing just amused the hell out of me. And I had a lot of fun doing that. But it's not a show that that many people remember, unfortunately. It was quite a good show. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you do your best. Right. So how is the, um, the difficulty of breaking in the field from your perspective looked like then versus now? There wasn't that much animation, really. It was mostly Saturday morning stuff. Mm -hmm. And yes, there seemed to be about seven or eight people that, uh, in fact, this is what an agent told me. He listened to my uh, animation demo and he said, it's very good. I could work with you. But he said, this, you're never going to get in there. Hanna-Barbera hires the same people over and over again. You, you haven't got a chance. But what happened was uh, Reagan came in and uh, one of the many things he was interested in w was uh, deregulation. And he put a guy in charge of the FCC who was also a deregulation type person. And he deregulated children's television. And suddenly children's television became much more um, economically feasible. You, it was much easier to make money because they restricted uh, how many commercial, they took away the restrictions on how many commercials you could run, this kind of thing. And so suddenly, instead of just a handful of shows for Saturday morning, you had all these, these series coming out, 65 episodes, 
designed to run Monday through Friday in the afternoons. And uh, suddenly there was a ton of work and, uh, you know, they, they wanted more people than just the six or seven folks that Hanna-Barbera had been hiring over and over and over again. So suddenly the doors opened up for a lot of us. And I just, uh, I just was in the sweet spot, you know, it was no great master plan. I just happened to show up at the right time. One of the few times in my life when that happened and, and off we went and uh, boy, it was about a, a, a 10 year run that was just amazing. So what, what made you want to write a book about your experiences as a voice actor? Like what, what lured you to start to put everything on paper? I mean, your book is fantastic. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it was sort of an accident. I did, um, there's a fellow, I'm sure you're familiar with him, uh, Rob Paulson. He's probably best known for the Animaniacs and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that sort of thing. And he does a podcast, it's called Talkin' Tunes, and occasionally he takes it on the road and he'll do a live thing. And he invited me and several other Transformers alumni to um, appear with him at uh, the Improv in, in Hollywood. And uh, I was kind of, I, I didn't know if I wanted to do that. I mean, it's a world famous comedy club and I'm not a stand up comedian. I thought, I, I don't know what I would do in a situation <laughs> like that, but I, I finally showed up and I'm so happy I did. We had a wonderful night. The place was crammed with Transformers fans and we just did just did shtick and answered questions from the audience and we just had a ball. And I thought, wow, you know, maybe I could write a monologue and then I could book myself into places and I do the monologue and then take questions afterwards. So I started to write this monologue. And as you can tell, it got out of hand. Yeah, voice recall. Certain a great yeah. long book. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I've either written, I'm writing the world's longest monologue or I'm writing a book. And I didn't really have the courage to admit to myself that I was writing a book because I didn't think I could write a book. And so I played a little game with myself. I would say, I'm not writing a book. I'm just writing this chapter. And if nothing happens after that, so be it. And then I would finish that chapter, get an idea for another chapter, rattle it around in my brain. I was not a very disciplined writer. I read that the, the, the grown-ups who write uh, dedicate a four-hour stretch of their day, and they go in and they write. And I don't care if the, the world is ending. Don't bother me. I'm writing. I didn't work like that. I just goofed around for 10 days thinking of thoughts and phrases and ideas for the upcoming chapter. And when I sort of reached critical mass where my head was just about to explode, I would dive for the keyboard and type it all up before it evaporated. And eventually uh, I realized, well, you really are, I guess, writing a book. And if you just bang out the next five or six chapters, you will have written a book which is something I never in a million years thought I was capable of because I'm really kind of lazy that way. <laughs> Are you still doing character work? To, you know, one does what one can. I, I do games. I do quite a few games. No, I've signed so many NDAs, I'm afraid to talk about what happened in high school because I may get into trouble over that. You know, don't you remember you signed an NDA before you took that algebra class? Oh, God, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then but I do games. And video game scripts are are so much different than animation scripts. Because in animation scripts, they um, if you're doing ADR, they give you hey for that scene, and you go piece by piece. And with animation scripts, it's just mm -hmm. here's the open dialogue, and maybe it's animated, mm -hmm. maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. But with video game scripts, they give you packets. Yeah, they're, they're books for every sure. single sure. every single noise because they need something for those different pathways no yeah. matter what decision that the uh, the character ends up taking, because you can't guide it like you would in animation. No, that's what makes it difficult. It is, you know, when you're doing a cartoon, you're playing a character and there's a story and you follow the story arc from the beginning through the middle to the denouement, et cetera, et cetera. And you're interacting with other characters. You know how to read a line because you see what the lead in line is and you're reacting to that. Uh, games, there's no story, there's no plot, there's there's just these lines, because you're actually you're interacting with the player, and that won't happen for months, you know, so right. you have to sort of imagine 
a, a scenario. And I've had situations where uh, there's a line and I, it's like, well, how do I, how do I approach this? Uh, and I, I'll say to the person directing, what's happening at this point? And they'll say, I don't honestly know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, do your best. And you, you kind of have to rev up something as opposed to coasting along on the energy of the story, which is right. the way you would do it in animation. What, what about voiceover acting has been the most difficult for you? Um, I, I kind of share the same problem that uh, another uh, legendary voiceover performer named Jack Angel has. He says, the most frightening words I hear in a studio are just be yourself, <laughs> you know? And it's like, I'll play any kind of crazy monster or lunatic or, or ordinary person you want, but uh, somebody says, just be yourself. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. How do you act yourself? You know, I, I right. you know. People, people who don't know a great deal about acting will say about certain actors, usually the, 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 the handsomer or more beautiful ones, will say, oh, he's just playing himself. She's just playing herself. No, 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 no. That, that's not what they're doing. I, don't, I think that's part of the, re the reason we get in this business is we don't really want to be ourselves, right. which is a kind of a sad commentary, but, you know, there it is. Right, because you as you end up doing so many different character voices and changing yeah. the tones, even just from your normal speaking voice, changing it so much. You're like, what? What? I'm so, what do I sound like again? <laughs> yeah, as an old friend of mine used to say, just use use your normal voice if you can remember what that sounded right. like right. before you got in this stupid business. <laughs> What do you believe that your greatest resources that have taken you so far in character animation are? Well, I, I think uh, probably a lot of it had to do with persistence because I was not welcomed with open arms uh, anywhere, really, uh, very often. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to just keep showing up and banging on the doors and hoping uh, that eventually one or two of them would pop open and thank goodness that they did. So I suppose it was, uh, it was that persistence. You know, my, I, I, think, I think I'm an instinctive actor. I don't have any sort of a, this is why I've never taught, because I don't know how to teach somebody to do this. Uh, the only thing I could say is just jump in and try regardless of what it is, little theater or announcing arrivals at the Greyhound bus depot, whatever, any kind of performing thing you can get involved in. And what you will find is in the beginning, all you hear is no, 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 no. And then suddenly in the midst of all this, somebody goes, wait, 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 yes, yes, that. Do more of that. And Sometimes they don't know what the hell they're talking about, but a lot of the time you get good advice. But, but what I'm saying is, the, every time you hear a yes, 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 hang on to that. And eventually you reach the point where you're getting more yeses than no's. And now you have developed a, a technique for yourself. That's what I think happened to me over the years. I just kept Every time somebody would like something I did, I'd file that away in the mental filing cabinet. Oh, this works. I must remember to do this again under other circumstances. And uh, eventually you have this little bag, of this filing cabinet into your head of, thing, of techniques that work. And I, I don't know how you teach that. So if you were to say, write a letter to yourself before you started voice acting, before you started in announcing, before you started becoming a voice monkey, what would that letter say? I think, uh, well, of course, I, it would have been lovely if I had known how nicely it would all turn out. And I would say to myself, don't worry about it. You're, you'll be fine. Might take a while, 
but you'll be fine. Don't forget to savor the moment as you travel through life. Don't spend so much of your conscious moments thinking about what you're going to do and just focus on what you are doing. That's probably what I would say to myself. That's pretty much it, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, people that want to read your book, where can they find it? Well, here is the book that we keep talking about. You try to reduce the glare. Neil Ross, Vocal Recall, The Life in Radio and Voiceovers. And uh, the best place to get started would be a website that I created uh, for the book. And that's www.neilbook.com, N-E-I-L-B-O-O-K.com. I'm actually the narrator of the book. Oh, I won. I won that audition, and uh, <laughs> believe me, thousands, thousands applied for that job, but I won. And uh, fantastic! Well, thanks for coming on, Neil. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for. Your oh, not a problem, Andrew. Thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed myself. I hope you enjoyed learning about how Neil got started in the industry and his tips and tricks towards consistently adding to the file cabinet of voices he keeps in his head. Thank you, Neil, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and sit and have coffee with me. If you'd like to read Neil's book, Vocal Recall, you can visit him at www.neilbook.com. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.